Thank you very much. Good evening, viewers. I'm very pleased to be here at Bethany TV. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Our viewers out there would want to know you and hear from you. Thank you so much. My name is Sabrina Chitaka. I am a pediatrician. I'm also an adolescent medicine specialist. And my area of specialization is infectious diseases. I teach at Makere University and work at Mulago Hospital. But in terms of adolescents, I help run the adolescent clinic at Mulago and Makere. We started over 10 years ago and now the clinic has grown. I also help manage the HIV adolescent clinic at the Baylor Children's Clinic. Okay. And not Bethany, but Baylor. Okay. <laughs> and that's an HIV clinic that has been running for the last maybe 20 years. Okay. I am a mother. My youngest is an adolescent. He's 17. So I'm right there in the mix of understanding these people. <laughs> because it's good you're actually dealing with them both at work and at, at home. home. So you're mm -hmm. having hands-on experience. Exactly. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. very, very interesting. Now, welcome to Bethany TV and the Pediatric Voice, your Wednesday show, where you learn so much about child health and what you can do to improve the livelihood of these children and how best we can help them grow into productive adults. I'm your host, Dr. Helen Namsoke. Um, but before we go deep into the discussion about adolescence, let's first have a documentary on adolescent health. Adolescence is the phase of life between childhood and adulthood from ages 10 to 19. It is a unique stage of human development and an important time for laying the foundation of good health. These comprise of about 1.2 billion people, that is one-sixth of the global population. Adolescents experience rapid physical, cognitive, and psychosocial growth. This affects how they feel, think, make decisions, and interact with the world around them. Despite being thought of as a healthy stage of life, there is significant death, illness, and injury in the adolescent years with their mortality estimated to about 1.1 million deaths per year. Adolescence comes with risky patterns of behavior, such as eating disorders, physical activity, substance use, and sexual activity that can eventually pose a risk of preventable deaths from road traffic accidents, suicide, substance intoxication, and unsafe sex. This could be attributed to restrictive national laws and policies, parental control, limited knowledge base in adolescent care, high cost of care, and lack of confidence in the care systems. To grow and develop in good health, adolescents need information including age-appropriate comprehensive sexuality education, opportunities to develop life skills, health services that are acceptable, equitable, appropriate and effective, and safe and supportive environments. Having seen the documentary on adolescent health, who is an adolescent? Wow, like we already had, an adolescent is somebody aged 10 to 19. They are going through a transition period. And for everyone to understand, an adolescent is not a, an, a big child. An adolescent is not a small adult. An adolescent is an adolescent. And it's important for us to treat them as a special group of people. Because for us as pediatricians, I think our main training is for us to to save little babies, mm -hmm. to save the neonates. And to actually save... when you listen, mm -hmm. uh, when you view the statistics, you yeah. find that most of them are talking about under five. Uh, under five. We, we mind so, so much of... To save them. And my gosh. And then when these same people get to their second decade of life, they start dying. They start becoming sick. And unfortunately, not many people understand how to take care of them. So for me, working in the space of adolescent medicine and adolescent health, I feel that every single healthcare provider, every single parent should understand these individuals. They are what? going through a lot of changes, transitioning from being a child to becoming an adult, and their hormones are surging. So, okay. Mm -hmm. So what makes them really special? The special in them 
is that they are specific age group, they're in their second decade of life, but also a lot of things are changing in their bodies. Before, when they were children, they were being used to being taken care of by their parents, by the pediatrician. But as they grow older, they are de developing some sense of independence. And yet, in fact, by our, you know, our constitution, they are still children. Mm. So people may not really understand where to put them or how to take care of them. And because they are going through a lot of um, stressful situations, you know, when the hormones are pouring out to enable them to become adults, sometimes they get angry, they get depressed, they are seeking for attention, and sometimes they make mistakes. They're extremely experimental, and that's around the time people start doing bad habits like smoking, doing drugs, maybe having their first kiss, mm -hmm. and maybe even more. So it's important that we treat them for who they are and make sure that we save them. You mentioned that nearly 1.2 million adolescents die on a on annual basis. basis. That's mm. a lot. And also we know that in Uganda, if you look at the population of adolescents, those are the ones who are catching many sexually transmitted infections, catching HIV. We recently reviewed statistics from our OFIA report and they showed that nearly 500 people in Uganda get HIV. That's if you break it down to on a daily basis, that's 50 people getting HIV every day. And the majority of those are adolescents, people aged between 15 to 24 years. And 24 years, I'm including them because these are young adults. And young adults and adolescents are really in the same category and we need to look at them in a special way because they are really still growing. Okay. Mm. Now that they are going through a lot of transitions, the confusion, sometimes mm -hmm. they don't know what to do with themselves. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we as well don't know how to deal with them. Yeah. I have a friend's son, mm -hmm. he's about 17 years and for the last, um, I used to see him from when he was like eight years mm -hmm. and he was comfortable. Mm -hmm. But most of the time he comes in when he's sick, he, actually, he, he wants to come in in the evening because he doesn't want to be in the queue mm -hmm. with the rest of the children he feels he's too big yes. for a pediatric yeah. clinic yeah yeah you know and indeed adolescents reach a point where and we we subcategorize them into early adolescents uh, those aged between 10 to 13 and then the middle adolescents aged between 14 and 17 and then the late adolescents who are aged between 18 and 19 and maybe even up to 21 and as you've rightly said when they are in the middle adolescence, they are starting to think they are adults, and yet in fact they are not yet adults, and they start be becoming shy about certain issues. They may not confide in you as a healthcare provider. They probably want to see an adult, adult doctor mm. who may not also be understanding ready to, their issues. To, you know, eh? and so that is why um, the WHO and and all adolescent health providers came up with a um, policy where adolescents should actually be seen by either specialized people or every single healthcare provider should be given adolescent responsive training. You should know how to interview them and, inter and interact with them. them. And all they want really is respect, a non-judgmental attitude and also confidentiality. If this 17-year-old comes and tells you, hey, Dr. Helen, I've got a girlfriend, and then you, you tell, tell their tell mom, the mother. don't tell the mom. <laughs> Just encourage him to make correct choices because by making correct choices, they are likely to live longer. And if they make a wrong choice, for instance, 17-year-old has a girlfriend and wants to go all the way, that's a problem. On the constitutional side, he could actually be sued for defilement. True. He could get this girlfriend pregnant, and yet he has no money to take care of a baby. He's not he ready has no to home. start. He's a being housed. <laughs> he's being given he's pocket being money. Given pocket and money books and to go to school. <laughs> and he needs to finish school. Yeah. So we need to be careful. And yet he wants to be a man, like he's macho, the beards have come. 
his muscles are bigger, his voice is probably deeper than his father's, you know, and yet he's not yet an a man. A man. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, especially the adolescents, especially in the mid, mid adolescents, tend mm -hmm. to face a lot of confusion mm -hmm. and challenges. Mm -hmm. What are those challenges? They, 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 they face. So in middle adolescence, that is around 14 to 16 around there, they are starting to develop uh, an identity, identity crisis, crisis, so to speak. And also that's around the time that the hormones are really pouring out, that the girls have probably started their menstruation, the boys are still growing taller, the girls are getting hips, and it's, it's amazing how peer pressure at this time works so hard on them. And remember, between 14 and 16, people are still in secondary school. So there's a lot of demands on them from school, from home, and yet their bodies are also demanding a lot of things. Their bodies are changing really, really fast. And then we are telling them, you have to read hard. You have to ensure that you, you excel in school. But and then, sometimes when they try to express out, the teachers feel like they are rebelling. Yeah, they become mm. rebellious actually. And yet, if the teachers could understand that this is how I should interact with these young people, I should respect them and uh, listen to them. They want you to listen to them. If you don't listen to them, then they are going to act up. And their peer pressure is going to push them into breaking school rules. And before you know it, they are delinquent. But also, this is a time where their creativity should be at the maximum. And they should be in school or places of institutions that can support them to be creative. For instance, enabling them to play sports, enabling them to, to, to do music, dance and drama, and even vocational skills, so that their brains keep growing. Remember, their brains are still growing for the last time. Mm -hmm. And if they are not sleeping enough, then their brains are not going to grow to the maximum capacity. There's such a statement as, if you don't use it, you'll lose it. And, and that is applying to the brain. If they don't use that brain, they're going to lose it. Because okay. it's not going to sign up, uh, develop many, many connections at that time. They may deny the need for parental support, and yet they need it. Remember, they need the data, they need the transport, they need the airtime, and yet the parents are telling them to, they're being a little bit harsh on them. And so they go into the adolescent blues, and they may lock themselves in the room and not talk. The girls want to be trim and proper and looking like little Yeah, body models. image is very important. Yeah, the body image is so critical for them at that time. And... If you don't understand that for them body image means everything, then you'll be like, why aren't you eating your food? Then you end up on a collision course with them. You're not eating, you need to eat. The adolescent in their mind is saying, I want to be slim and what and what and have what. Have a nice figure, a nice waist. Exactly. My face should not have uh, pimples. pimples. And yet at that time the pimples are at, at their, their maximum. <laughs> and so those who suffer from acne start becoming they lose confidence and they are flooding the, the dermatologist's clinics, you know. And a little pimple like this, one little pimple will Is be... So much for, for them. For them it's a big deal, yes. you know. And also for those who have delays in, in growth. Um, you know, there are those who grow very quickly and then those who, glow, who grow slowly. So the, the, the first ones may be teased and bullied, and then the ones who grow slowly are also going to be teased and bullied. Because adolescents, they, they don't, they, their grey matter hasn't really matured. matured. I, I actually faced a girl, mm. she was about 13 years, and mm. everyone around her was getting her menses. So she, I think she wondered why she's not getting hers as yet. So, so she, she started up. acting up every end of the month. She would mm. act up cramp. Oh, camping like so she, she ended up in one of the pediatric clinics and i met her and she would describe this cramping eh? and until it was not real eh? it was <laughs> not real until we sat down and all like, but why is it every happening every end of the month oh. 
you know. But also, you know, Dr. Helen, we've seen girls who have um, an imperforate hymen. Yes. And then every end of the month, they're screaming, they're crying, they're, you know what? I received a patient like that whose mom thought her child was, you acting know. Acting up. Not even acting up. She thought the child was being bewitched. Because oh. every month the poor child would be crying in and pain. rolling on the floor and my gosh. So when they came in, of course we have a way we an interview and also examine. You have to have a chaperone to be there when you're examining this girl. And my gosh, when we examined her, she was actually having real cramps. Real pain. Bambi. But on examination, her hymen was imperforate. Like, she still had her hymen, completely sealed, and then she was going through menstruation and her periods were not flowing. Flowing. So she had to go through so much pain. So yeah. we, we referred her to a, a gynecologist who slit perforated. The, perforated the hymen mm. and her problems Was resolved. Oh. Can you imagine? Yes. I've also had situations where the early maturers an 11 year old presented to the hospital and her mom was crying because one of the senior doctors had told her to do a um, MRI scan. Like how can your child start periods at 11 years? At 11 years. Most likely she has a brain tumor that is making her pour out a lot of hormones. Because she has <laughs> puberty. Like, come on, no, at 11. At 11, it's normal. People go through their periods even at 10. And the mother was like, thank you for coming us down. <laughs> <laughs> Before they would go through the race. Yeah. Of, um, mm -hmm. Okay. Now, having seen their notorious changes in life, uh, uh, it's understandable that most of them make mistakes. Mm -hmm. What are the common mistakes they, go, they tend to go for? One of the mistakes that adolescents do is experimenting and making wrong choices. And sometimes those wrong choices can be regrettable. They have consequences, like early teenage pregnancy. In Uganda, we know one out of every four girls is pregnant before the age of 18. That's a huge number. And it all starts with, oh, my friends told me that if I try and maybe jump up and down, I won't get pregnant. <laughs> or the partner confuses her and tells her it's okay if we do it in a certain position you won't get pregnant well, if we do it and we wash you know be, you'll be so safe there are so many myths that need to be debunked and i'm happy that the new vision is 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 replacing the straight talk i mean straight talk used to come and speak straight mm -hmm. to these kids but then the paper wound up but every Tuesday, the New Vision is now engaging a, a doctor or a healthcare provider to debunk some of these myths. Because many times, adolescents don't know where to get information. They may try and get the information from their peers. And remember... And sometimes it is wrong information. If you're too blind mice... Oh, it is too much for their age. Exactly. <laughs> if you're too blind mice leading each other, you may end up in the trap. True. <laughs> and then the other um, notorious thing that happens is trying out smoking and even drugs. Drugs, yes. And, and that can become an addictive problem and it's very difficult to manage. If we went to um, Butavika Hospital, I'm sure I would find young people as young as even 11, 12, 13, who are already hooked on drugs and alcohol. So I know that many beer companies put a statement that uh, it's not you know, safe, uh, until not safe years. before the age of 19, but it's, it's that adventurous nature and trying to defy rules that pushes these kids to then try out the alcohol. And sometimes they may even try out the unsafe brands because mm -hmm. they fear to buy out from the safe places. Are they are safe brands. <laughs> I don't know. I think the regulation <laughs> should push 
people not to sell any alcohol whatsoever to any child, child less than below 19. the age of 19. Okay, that is very, we are having a very interesting discussion here about adult saints and their related issues and how best we can maneuver them to make sure that they grow into productive adults. Let's come back shortly after the break. Welcome back from the break and thank you for watching Bethany TV for Health. You are live on the Pediatric Voice this Wednesday as we discuss adolescent health. I'm your host, Dr. Helen Namsoke, and today we are hosting Dr. Sabrina Chitaka Bakela, commonly known as SBK. Thank you. One of my mentors <laughs> from a distance. She's one of the people that inspired me to choose pediatrics, actually. Oh, thank you. Yes, and we are discussing the common and interesting issues with adolescents and how best we can improve their livelihoods. Now, you cannot talk about children without discussing schooling. And guess what? I'm introducing to you Disney Junior, Disney Junior School that is located at Natete, a school with excellent teachers that are willing to groom your child all roundly or holistically in all aspects of life it is located at natete it is a primary school as well as a daycare center that has school vans well-trained teachers a conducive environment for your child's learning and brain development remember our target is to grow into a middle income country and we cannot achieve that without grooming our children up appropriately. Now, Dr. Sabrina, before we broke off, we discussed the common and interesting challenges adolescents face. And uh, we realized that they, 
are at the stage of discovery. They want to try out so many things and sometimes they make mistakes like a sexual, you know, indulging into early sexual behavior, mm -hmm. early pregnancy, contracting HIV, alcoholism, to mention but a few. Are there risk factors in the environment? Is there a way we caretakers have contributed to their indulging into risk behaviors? I would say yes and perhaps no. But honestly speaking, the law of our land should support and protect these adolescents. For example, on the issue of alcohol, in countries such as the US and even in Canada and the UK, you cannot be allowed to take a drink unless you've shown your identity card. I'll tell you, nearly six years ago, I was in San Diego in the US and I ordered for a um, glass of wine and hey, they asked me for my identity card. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> I was shocked. I was like, hey, I'm a mom. They were like, sorry, we, we don't can't care. sell to you. We can't sell to you unless you show us your ID because we need to prove your age. Wow. They couldn't wow. see physically. Oh, that. no. Maybe I look, maybe <laughs> I look like an adult. <laughs> Just kidding. But anyway, people are that serious. And even in supermarkets, mm. unless you show an ID, they shouldn't sell alcohol to kids. True. But try walking into some of our supermarkets. And I think it's actually child abuse for a, mm. a guardian, a parent out there to, to send, send a child to buy a drink for them. It's wrong. Yes. It's wrong. Mm. And then there are other issues of safety. You know, like adolescents and teenagers die a lot from road accidents, from drowning. How like does, uh, when you come to road accidents, our law here does not oh. allow one to own a driving permit until they are at least 18. Yeah, but people beat the system. You'd be surprised at how many 16-year-olds are actually on the streets driving. driving. And not only any motor vehicle, including border borders and cars. I wish they could look at their, you know, age and prove that these people are actually mature enough. Because remember, when an adolescent is growing up, they don't have the judgment to say, you know, I won't speed at this point. I'm not going to overload this car. I'm not going to drink and drive. Those are rules that are there to protect them. Um, once, um, about maybe four years ago, I don't know if you remember, but there was a terrible accident of senior four leaders. The Luelo oh my goodness. accident, I remember. I, yes. I still Bombo think, Luelo, something Bombo of that sort. Road, I still feel really hurt at the loss of those brilliant boys. They were going to pick their results and they got into the car. One of them could drive and none of them survived. True. Those are the accidents. Mm -hmm. And those are the ones we know. But there are those who we never ever get to know. You know, people riding on border borders without helmets. That's a risk. And nobody enforces passengers wearing helmets. It's up to us as people of Uganda, as we move to the middle income status, to enforce such things, such safety rules, so that we can protect our children, that we can protect our teenagers from dying. They use a lot of border border rights, especially because they don't have the money to hire an Uber vehicle. And so they'll end up on a border border. Sometimes they are too fast, they feel the taxis is delaying them, they can't and take a walk. Yes, because they are impatient, they are going for their progi, you know, and we lose them. They'll break their bones, they'll crack their skulls because they are not wearing a helmet. But also seat belts. You've seen in cars, parents are driving, they are, you know, using their seat belts, but in the back of the car, their teenagers are there. Maybe singing, free. shouting, opening the windows, and they are not wearing their seat belts. Seat belts are a must. They are mandatory. And every seat has a seat belt, actually. And they should be wearing them. But the environment in which we live maybe does not allow for a seat belt. Because we've seen people in matatus, in the taxis. Are there enough seat belts for everyone? I'm not so I'm, sure. I'm also not sure. But mm. surely these are things that should be reinforced and mandated to protect mm. our children from dying. Okay. The other risks, obviously, as in the environment, 
There are clubs. Uganda is a happy country. Everywhere you go. People want to party, to club. They've even turned churches into club. You know, like of trans night discos, literally. I mean, I'm not, you know, bashing any church or what, but people go to nightclubs and also to overnight prayers. To enjoy their lives. To enjoy their lives. And what happens after that? Who is supervising the teenagers who are in overnight prayers or in disco halls where no one has looked at their ID and said, come on, you can't get in? Or you can't get out at this time of the night. I mean, if a teenager gets out at 3 a.m., where are they going? Where are they going? But they'll be received into some of those clubs. They'll be received into overnight prayers in the name of praying. But, and then there are school rules which are broken. And some parents get angry when school rules are broken and the child is sent away. But really, let us cooperate for the sake of our children because we want them to grow up into responsible citizens that they should achieve their fullest potential. Just like you and I are pediatricians and we are sitting here and we are proud to be pediatricians, we would like to see more young people becoming Growing into pediatricians, videos. Mm. becoming the future leaders of this country. But will they become, if they are dying from road traffic accidents, they are dying from assault injuries. And now we are seeing even street children growing up and becoming thugs, you know. But who is protecting rapists, you know? The children. Um, we've had various gruesome stories and perhaps we shouldn't be discussing them. But the more we talk about these things, the more people appreciate that Time has come when people should plan for their families. If I cannot manage two children in my house, why should I keep on giving more birth to more and more and more? Like, you know, they usually have a saying that, you know, God will take care of them, the government will take care of them, but parents, we must take care of our own children. No, every child deserves, actually has a right to, to be better. parented. Uh, parented to have a name yes. to have a home and that no child should be growing up on the street sure it is actually a big shame on us as a country if there are street children roaming around okay that is very very interesting now having mm. seen their challenges uh, you know some of them don't want to be seen in the pediatric clinics and yet they are not yet adults so we get confused on how to deal with them. Mm -hmm. Are there designated places in this country where they can seek care? Wow, very good question, <laughs> Helen. And I want to say that at Makere and Mulago, we do now have a specialized adolescent service. And also we do have specialized adolescent days for those in chronic care so that we see them on their own because they voted with their hands. Every time you do a survey or a research, the adolescents say they want to be seen on their own day. Because they don't feel good they don't feel interacting with the little ones. They don't Imagine feel Imagine being 17 and you're in a queue with an 11 months old. Guess what? The pediatrician will see the 11 year old first and you, you'll have to wait as a 17 year old. And also some people just load them, the chronic care patients, Children with diabetes, adolescents with diabetes, adolescents with HIV, with and they're being loaded with people who have a lot of, as a greater a lot of age, like grandparents. <laughs> grandparents with diabetes are going to be seen first because they are grandparents. They are old, they need to live. Yeah, and the poor adolescent there with their diabetes, with their asthma, they are struggling. So they need specialized clinics. But also, for us as healthcare workers, we need to learn how to interact with them, to respect them. We had a, a situation once where the, the nurse wasn't really understanding these adolescents. So they would come in dressed in their skimpy clothes and should hold the door and be like, first go and dress up properly. <laughs> But they're trying to, you know, yeah. like, you know, body image is very interesting. Exactly. Very important to th that age group. They need to yeah, show something. And, and like I was saying, Makere and Mulago have a clinic. I'm happy to note that Mbarara 
is also starting. Is also starting a clinic. Shout outs to Dr. Elizabeth Kemigisha and also Dr. Zari Rukundo who have started this adolescent clinic. Okay. Which is great. Okay. I would like to see every single university teaching hospital having an adolescent clinic because that's where it starts. Yeah, because mm -hmm. We don't have so much teaching about adolescents actually in school. Mm -hmm. That is very interesting. Now, you brought out a subject that is very interesting, adolescents living with chronic disease. Mm -hmm. We've seen our children that we have had a good life. They know how to take care of themselves, the ones living with HIV, asthma, diabetes, mm -hmm. sickle cell. And you guess what? As they are living in the adolescents, it's very fortunate that we are getting to lose a good number of them. And the question is, where is the gap? How can these little ones be helped to transition just before they see the physician mm -hmm. while they are living with their chronic illness? Because we've seen most of them, the issue is confidence, the fear. They have colleagues, their peers learning that they're living with a chronic illness. So they tend to fear taking their medication. Well, I'd say that uh, one of the hardest things is to be an adolescent. But also, taking care of an adolescent is really hard. <laughs> so when people are adolescents, the sheer burden of having another illness to deal with is, is difficult. You know, they have diabetes and then they are struggling to grow up. They have challenges of adolescence, the psychosocial challenges, the body image, the inquisitivity, the experimental nature that they have. And then they have this chronic illness. Someone wonders, Guess why what? me? Why do I have sickle cell? They are going to why, prioritize why their being an adolescent. And so they will shove the medicine. They won't use it because they want to be like any other normal adolescent. adolescent. And so they'll get complications. Like if you're a, a diabetic, if you have diabetes, and then you're not using your insulin pump, you're not using your insulin injections, clearly you're going to get into a hyperglycemic episode, and then you come in with a, a crisis. If or you, you have damage your kidneys. Sickle cell disease, you're not taking your hydroxyurea, you're not getting routine vaccinations, you're going to come in with a crisis. But adolescents think short term. Well, today I won't take my medicine. I'll be happy with my friends. And before you know it, the crisis. kidney is gone. The, the crisis kidneys is are gone. There. They have acute chest injury. They have an infection. And my gosh. Sometimes it is too late to manage and treat. The worst case scenario is dying. Oh, yeah. Very mm. sad. Now, um, leave alone those ones who have chronic illness. They are illnesses that can be preventable mm -hmm. during adolescence. Yep like cervical cancer and so many. Uh, what are the examples of those illnesses that we can do something during adolescence so that we don't see young adults dying off early? Good point. Um, some of the diseases that start during adolescence, sadly, they will go on into adulthood. And such diseases include human papillomavirus infection. infection. Mm. If a child or an adolescent gets human papillomavirus and it's got through sexual intercourse, or through kissing. The human papillomavirus can actually remain in the cervical endoderm and affect this person much later on when they are in their late 20s, 30s, or even 50s, and they get cervical cancer. So prevention is better than cure. I like to use short statements for adolescents so that they understand if they walk into the clinic, into our practice, and I tell them, have you heard of human papillomavirus? And they're like, oh, I don't know what that is. So you tell them simply this is a virus, it's a, it can get you through sexual you know, behavior, even kissing. And if you get the vaccine, it's not a license for you to go and start having sex. Sex, no, it's not. It's just mm. prevention for the yes, future. The future. Mm. So. We start vaccinating adolescents from the age of 10 up to 13, but also we know that we can vaccinate them until whenever, you know. In our clinic, we vaccinate adolescents even up to when they are young adults, up to the age of 24. So that's possible.
There are other vaccines that need to be topped up or boosted, including a tetanus vaccine. Remember that tetanus vaccine wanes off. Yes. It wears off. It's greatness and capacity to protect you. And tetanus off. is rich in our environment. And actually. tetanus is in the soil. It's there. It's in the soil. If you get an injury you, and you've not been vaccinated, you can get tetanus. Many of our patients on our ward between the age of 7 to 12 who come in with tetanus, they really struggle to survive. So repeating the vaccination of tetanus is important. Screening them for tuberculosis is important. Remember TB is another peak during adolescence. Mm. Okay, that is very interesting. It has been quite uh, an educative discussion and very interesting about adolescence. <laughs> but our public, our viewers out there would want to hear a take home message from you. Thank you. Um, like we've, I've, I've really enjoyed that discussion as well, and I, I don't think it's the end of this discussion. I believe that each and every one of us should understand that adolescents are a special group of people, they're aged between 10 and 19, and many changes are undergoing. They're undergoing many changes in their bodies, including the secondary sexual characteristics, the girls develop breasts, the girls get hips, their voices become more smooth, their skins are, you know, sometimes up and down, they could get acne. Boys are also getting beards, their muscles are growing bigger, they are growing taller. But it's important for us to love them. I think for me the most important thing is to show them love, respect and a non-judgmental attitude. Just like we took our children for routine vaccinations when they were babies, we know now that preventive medicine is important even for adolescents. That they should come in into the clinic. We run a free Friday adolescent clinic at Mulago and we've seen so many adolescents by the way. Um, I think our last count was 12,000. 12, they come in for vaccinations, they come in for counselling, they come in to take their weights and heights. It starts with them understanding their bodies. It starts with us being responsible and supporting them through this transition period so that when they become adults, they'll be responsible. Adolescents start good behaviors and even bad behaviors, which they will take on into adulthood. So if we train them to sleep enough, exercise, eat healthy, they will carry on these things even when they are adults. And the main point is we would like to save them in their second decade of life so that when they become older, they will be the future Ugandans. They will be the future leaders, teachers, and other professions. Okay, thank you very much for teaching the world and uh, for taking off your time to take care of these interesting in videos. Now, everyone has a right to live to their utmost potential and productivity and guess what if we took very good care of adolescents having learned that it is a stage of a spark of hormones discovery and initiation of so much more that is likely to happen in adulthood including some of them understanding their chronic illnesses and there's so much more that is going on in their lives we ought to be intentional in taking care of our children i know the world is so busy we are chasing the jobs and so much more that is happening in our lives. But as parents and caretakers, we ought to give time to our children, especially the adolescent period, to teach them a lot of what is going on in their life. As a parent, you can train them on how to deal with the money and how to interact with the others in the society to avoid the social peer pressures, to avoid the so many risky behaviors they may indulge in, such as alcoholism, sexual and self-sexual activity and so much more. That is it we had this week on the Pediatric Voice. Till we meet next time for interesting discussions.